eQuez. Your quest for education starts here. Welcome to eQuez Audio. Hello, everybody. I'm Margaret Feldman, the founder of eQuez, a platform that helps students discover careers, find best fit schools, and make smart choices about higher education. This is episode six of Inside with eQuez, where we take an inside look at the journeys and lives of students and professionals who are studying to enter or work in a particular career. Today, we are speaking with Dr. Jennifer Folk, a board certified concierge podiatrist. After listening to this episode, if podiatric medicine sounds interesting to you, visit eQuez.com, that's E-Q-U-E-Z.com, to get connected to best fit podiatric medical schools. Dr. Jennifer Folk is a Santa Monica-based, board-certified concierge podiatrist specializing in sports podiatry and cosmetic procedures. Her practice caters to runners, athletes, and busy working professionals who may not have the time or means of easily getting in to see the doctor. Jennifer started running at the age of three and achieved success at an early age. She continued running in college, but after sustaining her fourth foot fracture, she stopped competing temporarily to focus on her education. Those injuries, though, were a catalyst for her focus on podiatric medicine and for her dedication in getting athletes back to their optimal health and sporting potential. Her goal is to provide the necessary tools to help keep her patients on their feet. Now, let's hear from Dr. Jennifer Folk. Uh, Dr. Falk, welcome to our show. We're very excited to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Okay, well, let's let's get started. So how did you, Dr. Falk, first learn about the field of podiatry and get interested in it? Uh, so I knew about podiatry at a pretty early age. I've been an avid runner for years and sustained multiple stress fractures in my feet as a result of running. So I started seeing a podiatrist for my injuries when I was just a teenager. Oh, wow. So I've known about the profession pretty early on. Okay, excellent. And when you started going to see your podiatrist, did that pique your interest or did it take some time for you to go there multiple times? Uh, no, I mean, after recovering from my injuries and being able to return to running and competing, I knew immediately from that point on that I wanted to be a physician. And then after shadowing a few different healthcare professionals and doing a lot of research, I decided to pursue podiatry then. Got it. And what different shadowing experiences did you do? I did a physical therapy and then as well as orthopedics and then podiatry. I, I knew I wanted to be on the sports medicine kind of sports side of things. So that's where I kind of honed in on those three. Got it. And with orthopedics, that involves taking the MD route. So you ended up taking the DPM route. What was your reason for choosing a doctor of podiatric medicine versus a medical degree in the orthopedic route? Yeah, so for me, it made more sense to go directly into podiatry because it was more streamlined route of getting to where I wanted to be. Okay, uh, It's four years of podiatry school, then three years of residency, whereas going the orthopedic route, you first have to match with that program. And then after medical school, it's five to six years of residency of either a sports medicine or foot and ankle fellowship just to get you to the same end goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I kind of just wanted to streamline it and go directly into podiatry and do foot and ankle because that's what I wanted to do. Uh, then there's a couple other things too, uh, based off of what I was researching. I noticed that podiatrists had different subspecialties within their field. So, you know, some people do wound care, others look at dermatological issues. I like the sports medicine side, so I really kind of wanted to jump into that as well as do general foot and ankle care. And then lastly, I noticed that podiatrists outside of their profession had other interests and hobbies that they were capable of doing, which was appealing for me because I like getting involved in different activities and business ventures and not necessarily being contained in a clinic 40 hours a week. Right. So between the education, the career path and the lifestyle, podiatry just seemed the perfect route for me. Great. Sounds like it it offers some flexibility as far as your your time. Would you say that you have a a good work-life balance? 
I, I feel like I do now. Um, I think that like any sort of healthcare field, you can kind of make it what you want, you know, depending on oh, the specific specialty that you do go in, mm-hmm. you know, regardless of what medical field it is um, or the practice that you're involved in too. Mm-hmm. You know, if you become an employee and you work for a hospital, you may not have as much control um, over your schedule or, you know, flexibility, whereas right. going to private practice, you know, I do have more control over my schedule and, you know, how I want to uh, set up my schedule and see patients. So it's, it varies, you know, on any sort of field on, on what sort of lifestyle you want to have. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Falk, that there are any misconceptions about podiatry or what podiatrists do? Yes, absolutely. Uh, The podiatry profession has progressed and advanced at a much faster rate than even physicians have recognized. So not only does the general public have misconceptions about what podiatry is or what podiatrists are actually capable of doing, even some healthcare professionals don't entirely understand what our education consists of, how comprehensive our residency training is, and what our scope of practice is. Uh, There are some podiatry students that actually share the same classroom as medical students. And as of 2013, all residency programs have to be three years in length. In my residency program, we did rotations along the internal medicine residents. And with respect to our specific podiatry training, we're trained to treat deformities and pathologies of the foot and ankle, as well as doing rotations outside of that even. Um, but they include both non-operative and surgical treatment options. So even though previous generations of podiatrists uh, maybe weren't even residency trained and did palliative care, now they're getting at least three years of surgical training in the foot and ankle Mm -hmm. and doing full reconstructive procedures to correct really severe foot and ankle deformities. Got it. So the profession has come a long ways and the training has changed. Yes, yes. And so it's only a matter of time until everybody else catches up and right, and right. recognizes it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's great. Got it. And I know you mentioned this before, but there are different areas that podiatrists can specialize in. Uh, do you, I know you mentioned sports medicine. So is that primarily what you do? Or, or tell us a little bit more about what you focus on specifically. So I do generalized foot care, you know, as far as plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, ingrown toenails, you know, common foot and mm-hmm. foot problems. Um, but my two main interests are one is the sports medicine side, and then the other is this kind of cosmetic procedure side, which is really also not a very known thing. Um, so on the sports side, it's treating athletic injuries, doing custom orthotics, different injection therapies. And then on the cosmetic side, I do a nail restoration procedure for nail fungus and other nail traumas, as well as dermal foot fillers for fat pad atrophy, which are like a synthetic filler, like the ones dermatologists actually use in the, in the face, okay. uh, we put them in the foot to actually restore the lost cushion on the ball of your foot. And it allows women to go back into those high heels and wear them comfortably. So kind of sports and cosmetic side, but I do generalize, you know, foot pain and deformities as well, too. Okay, got it. I noticed on your website that you do concierge services. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what those services entail and how concierge medicine works? Yeah. So concierge medicine, when it first originated, was kind of based on the notion that physicians would charge an annual or monthly fee to patients. And then in return, the patients would receive unparalleled care, which included, you know, same day appointments, house calls, and then these remote services, email, phone correspondence. Um, And then the purpose of having this is to kind of decrease the patient load for the physician um, and allow more time to be spent with individual patients on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now concierge medicine in general has grown and expanded into different branches like direct primary care and different hybrid systems. And then on top of that, physicians like myself kind of pick and choose from different aspects of it to create Mm -hmm. our own little niche and our own little like 
quote unquote concierge practice. Okay. Um, so for example, uh, lo- unlike concierge, like primary doctors that charge an annual or monthly fee, I'm still on a fee for service schedule. So I don't accept insurance. I'm cash pay. Um, but for the reason I don't, uh, I don't charge an annual fee or a monthly fee is because I'm not seeing those chronic issues or having patients follow up on a very routine basis, like the primary care doctors do. Okay. Uh, at the same time, I limit my patient load. Each patient gets about an hour with me each visit instead of, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And then after becoming a patient of mine, I also don't charge for email or phone phone uh, correspondence. So they've got free remote access to me afterwards. Um, I can see them again, you know, same day after hours on the weekends, you know, during the holidays, um, in office, at home. You know, I kind of make myself available to them, and it's it kind of is the purpose is to create more of like an intimate relationship with the patients and allowing them to be able to be seen when and where they want to. So that's why I consider myself in like the concierge medicine route, even though I may not have all those little aspects of what you consider concierge practice. Okay. Got it. So it does involve, just to clarify, so it does sometimes involve like you going directly to patients' homes or, or meeting them where they are for their convenience. Yes. Yep. Okay, so what does your typical day entail? And I'm I'm guessing they're all not the same. So what could your day look <laughs> yeah. like? So that's it is different every day. Um, I have to very I have to keep a, a schedule on me because it is a day to day thing. I do have set office days um, and set house call days um, that are you know strictly for the office or strictly for house calls. However. Um, I do, if I have gaps in my day, I do go over and, you know, do a house call in the middle of the day if I need to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it varies day to day, you know, whether I just see patients in the, in the office or sometimes in the afternoon, I'll, I'll duck out early and then I'll go, you know, over into the West side somewhere, um, and see someone in a house call. Okay, cool. And Dr. Falk, what is your your favorite part of your job? Uh, my favorite jo- part is actually just having the patient visit. Uh, mm-hmm. I enjoy spending time uh, with my patients, and that was part of the reason why I created my own practice was to be able to do that, mm-hmm. to be able to spend time and educate them. And I feel that if they've learned anything from their experience with me, it, that in itself is gratifying. Mm-hmm. I feel like it would be uh, definitely very rewarding to be able to help people uh, get back on their feet once they've had an injury or just are having a foot problem. Because I know for me, your feet, you just take them for granted. You don't know you know, what it would be like if you have an issue and then you can't get around. Yes, it's a very interesting profession because there are a lot of people that either don't know that we even exist yeah. or don't think about their feet yeah. until there is a problem. And then it's, oh, this is really a problem. You know, it it can be very life altering for some people. You know, I tell a lot of my patients that, you know, when they need to slow down or stop or get off of their foot, you know, I get a lot of pushback, like they can't do it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, if it was your hand, you'd put it in a sling, you'd go on with your day, no fuss, you wouldn't worry about it. I'm right. trying to tell you to do that to the, the same thing to your foot. And it's a whole nother story. Right. So it's definitely a different beast to tackle as far as, you know, actually treating it. Um, but I've also noticed that some people don't even know that we exist until all of a sudden they need a foot doctor. And then yeah. they find Yes. And uh, Dr. Falk, would you, would you recommend the field of podiatry to prospective students? I think podiatry is a very good profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as we were talking about, we're on our feet daily and we go through a lot of wear and tear. So eventually most people are going to have a foot problem at some point in their lives. And then with so many people having all these other living longer or, you know, um, the way that diabetes is, you know, very prevalent nowadays, uh, Mm -hmm. foot care needs are increasing and they're only going to continue to increase. And the profession is not going to go away and it's going to likely continue to progress and grow in itself. So the outlook looks good. 
for yes. future podiatrists. <laughs> yes. Okay. Good to know. So I saw on your website that you are a running coach. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So I've been running since I was about three years old. My dad was an all-American runner, ran for Nike for a while. So he raised three girls to be runners. Okay. Um, And so, uh, you know, it's... It's good that it's exciting to to do this and to start offering it. I started doing it for a friend of mine, and then it just kind of expanded from there. So um, I really enjoy doing it. I, I like being able to give back and help other runners, both from a training standpoint and then medically, you know, mm-hmm. if, if necessary. So it's strictly just online right now where people can find me if they want to either get off the couch and just run a 5K or if they want to have a PR in their half marathon. Um, I still race and so and I have experience coaching uh, from when I was in college I actually helped assist a middle school track team for coaching so I have the experience I have the background I have the knowledge and so I thought why not put it to use yeah absolutely <laughs> so it's just another another thing kind of along the side but it's it's a lot of fun yeah, I, I love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about your practice and how people can get in touch with you if they are interested in learning more or just connecting with you for medical services? Yeah, so I am kind of on all social media accounts, so it's pretty easy to find me. Um, most people just Google search, you know, I don't even know what they search for me. Um, Mm -hmm. but you know, my practice is at your feet, concierge podiatry. The website is ayfpodiatry.com. Um, and then my cell phone is 310-310-1201. People call me, people text me. Um, and I, like I said, I offer same day, the next day appointments, um, you know, if need be after hours, um, and and then wherever, whenever, um, you know, I do telemedicine stuff so I can treat anybody in the state of California remotely, um, through like video visits and such. Um, otherwise, you know, house calls and stuff, I, I stick to kind of LA County to do that. Okay, great. Is there anything else that you would want prospective students to, know as they're sort of researching and and figuring out if this might be the right career for them? Yeah. So this, uh, I mean, my advice for going into any sort of graduate education, not just, you know, podiatry, um, is just to kind of do your research beforehand. It's a major investment from both a monetary and a time commitment standpoint, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. You know, having a graduate degree, doctorate, master's, whatever it is, um, can lead to an amazing career and great opportunities. And it will always be beneficial. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing at the end of the day, then it's not going to be worth it. And yeah. you're going to end up miserable and in debt. Yes. <laughs> so- so I would just say research and just yeah. make sure, you know, and if it is something in the healthcare field or, you know, maybe even other fields, you know, shadow, that's, you know, what I did, make sure that that's really what you want to do, you know, just because you have an interest in something, you don't want to go down that path for five, 10 years and then get to the job and then realize that's not what you wanted to do. So try to research um, as much as possible or go shadow as much as possible. Absolutely. I completely agree. And one thing that I've always told students is if you shadow or if you intern, even if you don't like it, that's a win for you because now you've just sort of narrowed down, you know, what you don't want to do, which will help you get on the path of what you do want to do. So I I completely agree. Exactly. Okay. So final question. If you could go back to your first day of podiatric medical school, uh, what would be one piece of advice that you would give yourself? So I don't really have a piece of advice for myself, um, unfortunately. However, um, it's a, I could give a piece of advice to other students and something that I actually did that I found helpful that, um, I think other, you know, potential podiatrists or future podiatrists could, um, hopefully benefit from. And that's actually 
finding someone in the class ahead of you um, that you can kind of latch onto and get advice from, you know, along the way. That second year student was a first year student, you know, yeah. months ago. You know, they know the classes, they know the teachers, they know the ins and outs and how to survive the year. And I, I personally did that it just kind of by random happenstance. Um, you know, I made friends with a second year. I made friends with a third year, um, my first year. And so for both of them, I was constantly, you know, asking questions, how to study, you know, what do I need to know? Um, I got textbooks from them. You know, it just, yeah. it's very, very beneficial to kind of have a, a big brother or big sister to help you along the way. And it's a very small, close knit profession that you kind of become a family with those people that are in your class or even in your school because it is so small that yeah. they're there to help you. And, you know, they haven't forgotten <laughs> the struggle that just happened. Yeah. So, you know, that would be my piece of advice to anybody kind of entering that first day of school is to, to find mentors to kind of help them out. Yeah, I think that's a great piece of advice for students to think about doing. Thank you for listening to Equez Audio. To learn more about podiatry and to explore schools, head over to equez.com. That's e q u e z.com to get personally matched to best fit programs. If you enjoyed listening, be sure to subscribe and we would love for you to rate and review us. Keep in mind that our discussion today mentions views and opinions that are personal in nature and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any university, agency, organization, employer, or company, and should be used at your own discretion. We wish you the best in your quest for education.